Europe's farmers are revolting. Across Europe, they are blocking roads, driving their tractors into cities, and dumping manure on government buildings. What started off in the Netherlands and Poland has spread to other European countries, where farmers have demonstrated their anger against the European Green Deal's environmental rules, inflation, cheap imports from Ukraine, and the prospect of imports from South America. For a small farmer, this threatens completely their business model. But it's not only about the new legislation. Farmers are faced with a series of headwinds that threaten their ability to stay in business and poses a severe question on the ability of the EU's agricultural model to stay competitive and keep feeding its people. So why are Europe's farmers so mad? Is this actually all the EU's fault? And what will come next? So the EU is a food superpower, albeit a fragile one. And when we look at the data on European food exports, the EU has never exported more food products than it does today. Since 2002, the amount of food exported by the EU has nearly tripled. Just take a look at this map. Europe is one of the most heavily farmed regions of the world. Part of this is the result of the common agricultural policy, which makes up a third of the EU budget and was set up to end the rampant food shortages after the end of World War II. But at the same time, the EU has never imported as much food as it does now either. And that's because part of European agriculture is quite globalized. On the one hand, it imports commodity products like soybeans from Brazil, which it then feeds to livestock to export high value added animal products. But this trade is not only the result of strategic choices, it's also the result of the EU's strict food safety standards. European milk powder, for example, is prized worldwide, particularly in China, which saw a tainted milk scandal that poisoned nearly 300,000 infants in 2008. This trade represents about 7.6% of the EU's total trade and is quite profitable for the farmers that participate in it. But this focus on high value products, combined with the fact that European farmland makes up such a big proportion of total land use, has quite some environmental implications. The Netherlands, which is Europe's champion of farm profit maximization, thanks to its large meat and dairy industry, has some of the highest nitrogen emissions in all of Europe, which are responsible for health issues and damage biodiversity. Yet not all European farmers are producing milk, cheese, and meats. And for those that don't, life is much harder. The EU basically has a two-tiered agricultural system, with on the one side those that are specialized in high-value export products like wine, livestock, or dairy, as well as large, modern, productive farms. If you're one of those farmers, good for you. You're basically a winner of globalization, or you're competitive enough to be able to navigate it successfully. On the other hand are the losers of globalization, the series of mostly small family-run farms which don't produce those high-value products and have fewer means to invest in increasing their productivity. We can actually see this on this graph with the value of farm by type, where we can see that Europe's smallest farms are the least profitable by far. And this is the point where we have to talk about EU subsidies in the form of the common agricultural policy and where its billions of euros go. After all, all the farmers get so much money, so what are they complaining about? Well, if we break down the common agricultural policy, we can see that it gives out money for four main things. BIS, which grants incomes the larger your farm is. CRIS, which grants income for the first few hectares and basically gives support to small farmers. CIS, which supports certain crop producers and finally, eco-schemes that grant money for sustainable land management. This subsidy system and the way it's set up results in two contradictory things that are happening at the same time. On the one hand, the 20% largest EU farms receive 80% of all the subsidy money. After all, most of the subsidies are granted on a per hectare basis. The more land, the more potential for subsidies. But at the same time, if we look at the share of subsidy revenue as a share of farm value, we can see that Europe's smallest farms are hyper-dependent on the remaining subsidies that they receive, with EU subsidies making up roughly 55% of the value added of the EU's smallest farms. And if we look at a breakdown by sector, we can see that the meat farms, mixed-use farms, and grain farms receive the most subsidies. In other words, the CAP is making sure that Europe keeps producing things like grain or meat, which would probably be unprofitable otherwise. But it's also keeping less competitive small farms that would otherwise likely be out of business alive. Yet even despite the support, it's tough being a small farmer. EU farming has been consolidating into larger and larger farms over the past two decades. In 2020, there were 37% fewer farms than in 2005, while the amount of land in cultivation stayed mostly the same. It's in this context of a two-tiered agricultural system and farm consolidation that European farmers are faced with a triple storm in the form of Russia's invasion of Ukraine, climate change, and the EU's new environmental policies, not least the farm-to-fork package. 
But let's start with Russia's invasion of Ukraine, for which there were several consequences. First, a rise in global commodity prices for things like fertilizers, for which Russian export quotas limited availability and increased prices. Then, high natural gas prices as a result of economic sanctions imposed by Europe meant that many of the continent's energy-intensive fertilizer factories shut down, many permanently, leading to more expensive international imports from the United States, affecting the bottom line of farmers. At the same time, in an attempt to keep the Ukrainian economy afloat, the EU has been letting in grain and other agricultural products like poultry, eggs, sugar, and oil seeds into the single market, where they outcompete European producers. Agricultural imports from Ukraine nearly doubled between 2021 and 2022, as agricultural products were being redirected from blockaded ports in the Black Sea to Poland and Romania. On top of this, farmers, particularly in southern Europe, have been affected by reduced yields due to droughts and floods that are expected to become more frequent with climate change. And now enters the EU, with both its reform of the common agricultural policy and its signature farm-to-fork strategy, here to tackle some of the very real environmental problems linked with EU agriculture. So the CAP reform changed somewhat the way in which money was allocated. They tried to increase conditionality. They tried to increase conditionality, like payments should not be just direct payments per hectare, they should, there should be some conditions. These included, for example, a measure to leave 4% of fields fallow, as in empty, though it has never been actually applied to this date. On top of this, the EU created the Farm to Fork strategy as part of the European Green Deal, which aimed to make European agriculture greener and tackle some of the very real problems linked with EU farming, such as unhealthy soils and poor biodiversity, which would also eventually lead to a loss of output. The way it planned to do this was by increasing organic farming by 25%, reduced fertilizer use by 20%, and pesticide use and risk by 50%. But the thing is, the results of the CAP reform and the farm to fork strategy are quite predictable. Lower yields. According to this report by the GRC, the research arm of the European Commission, the farm to fork strategy with its focus on organic farming and reduced pesticide and fertilizer use would result in a 10 to 15% fall in many of the EU's agricultural outputs. These decreases in production would have to be outsourced from elsewhere and also raise food prices by an average of 12%, according to that very same report. Some of these objectives seem very bold. But some people said, well, you're asking us to do this and there's no funding back in it. So if I had to summarize the farmer revolt in Europe in one sentence, it would be that they are the result of a two-tiered farming system where less economically viable farms are being supported by an increasingly demanding subsidy system that would require production cuts for environmental reasons, affecting their bottom line while at the same time experiencing external shocks. Whew. That just rolls off the tongue, doesn't it? So the protests are happening, farmers are mad, but what is happening now politically with the farmer backlash? A strategy that the commission has chosen is to uh, scale back their ambitions and to backtrack. They have uh, withdrew um, the, the plan for reducing pesticides in the EU officially. As for the farm to fork strategy? It just, it's, it's just fading slowly by the end of the, of the mandate. And I think, of course, there is a might be the war in Ukraine and just food inflation, cost of living crisis, etc. I don't think they expected that when they drafted the, this uh, at the end of the mandate. So we're next for Europe's farmers and the agribusiness industry, because after all, many of the structural issues with the European farming remains. Small farms are still unprofitable, the environment is still being damaged, and climate change is still a thing. Well, that depends on who you ask and what your goal is, but there are four overlapping and possibly complementary ways for Europe to move forward. The first pathway would be to push ahead with the current strategy and promote Europe's more environmentally friendly small farm model and promote green farming practices. But that would increase Europe's dependency on other parts of the world, require a reallocation and potential increase in subsidy money. This would also likely lead to higher food prices and to an outsourcing of both production and emissions to other parts of the world where food safety standards are not as strict. And with this approach, we can also ask ourselves one crucial question. Is it really smart to plan a decrease in food production at a time where food insecurity is on the rise globally? If the goal is food production, profits and food security, then the choice seems to be to increase and accelerate the consolidation of European farms, which would be bigger and more profitable and therefore more resilient to external shocks like the invasion of Ukraine. But that would come at the cost of increased environmental degradation due to the larger footprint of specialized and industrial sized farms. Another pathway forward would be to open up European agriculture to international competition, 
which could lead to lower food prices. But that would mean importing food from countries which have lower sustainability requirements, use more pesticides, and create new dependencies for Europe. This approach, which includes things like the now seemingly defunct EU Mercosur trade deal, is extremely unpopular with farmers and would introduce a new foreign competitor. And finally, a fourth pathway exists, and that is to improve Europe's agriculture through technology. This goes through European satellites like Copernicus or even drones, which allows better monitoring of crops and using the right amount of fertilizer and pesticides for fields. In another development, the European Parliament just took the first step to easing what is some of the world's strictest regulation on GMOs, opening the door to improve yields, increase drought resistance, and decrease pesticide and fertilizer needs for agriculture. It's something that might actually have a chance at passing, considering the falling opposition to GMOs across the continent. But what do you think? Can Europe offer a fair deal to farmers while keeping its food production secure and improve the environment? Let me know what you think in the comments down below. If you like the video, feel free to support the Into Europe channel on Patreon.